<laughs> Historical now. <laughs> and he was our second long time president, more than 10 years, about 10 years. <laughs> and yeah. I, I used to be, I, I was in Australia uh, under Colombo plan before, uh, way back in the six, late, late 60s, um, under arrangement with the Ministry of External Affairs, Australia, at that time. As a young man, <laughs> Lancer is a, a very, 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 uh, very knowledgeable in terms of the water management, both uh, water as a resource and also the utilities part of it. Uh. So certainly, I think he has a lot of experience to add on as well. It's yes, a sir. pleasure to meet you, and it's a, a pleasure to join in the Malaysian right. uh, talk this afternoon. And I'm um, I'm pleased that you've had the opportunity to visit Australia, uh, albeit some time ago. <laughs> That, that was the time when uh, the dam, Marambiji, or was it the, and, uh, the big dam was completed at that time. They, uh, I used to visit that before. Um, uh, Blower, Blowering Dam is one of the major dams on the Marambiji. Oh, yes. It's Ma mm. is it Marambiji? Marambiji? Or, uh, yeah, Marambiji River. Marambiji, yes. yes. Yeah. Well, well, there were a couple of larger storages on the Marambiji constructed mm. in the 1960s uh, in the New South Wales system uh, and then I'll, I'll go through some of the, the larger constructions when they were done briefly but uh, I'll cover that as such yep yes well I think as far as water resources is concerned I, I, I'm here to listen to what on water resources is well managed in Australia not enough water we got plenty of water and we are not managing that well, uh, right, Dato? <laughs> yeah, it's a management problem. <laughs> we have always saying this is a management problem or governance problem in short, right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Certainly. Right. Is Joe? Joe, just play one more time. Our Joe, Joe, Mira, minta Joe main sekali lagi before we start. Slow skater. Huh? Okay, this is our next uh, master class on the water safety plan in Malaysia. Challenges and key success factors. This has been always in the in the background, the lukewarm <laughs> implementation of this. So we want to revive this and make create more awareness to the uh, our stakeholders and also the water utilities to take it more seriously. Otherwise, this will have an impact on our water river, uh, half of our river as well as on the drinking water quality in the long term. So uh, Dr. Haviza Hassan from Ministry of Health, she will be sharing with us on this on the 3rd of June. Okay, this is our next uh, conference. It will be a virtual conference, uh, Water, uh, Malaysia International Water Convention 2021, 20th, 20th to 24th September 2021. It will be exhibition, conference, workshops, technical tours, and also poster competition. So the theme is navigating the future of water in the new norm. Eh? So this is organized by MWA and uh, with the event manager for them uh, events. Okay, next. Uh, now, this is our latest publication that is coming out very soon. 
is the MWA planning guidelines, best practice handbook for water supply system, an update of the old uh, uh, design guidelines that we printed from, uh, inherited from uh, old public works department in, the, in 1990, 1998, 1999. So this is updated version and they will be coming out very soon. Okay, next. Uh, this is a very, very important and very interesting book. If you want to know everything about water in Malaysia, this is the book that you need to turn to with statistics, with uh, investment uh, figures, with the, 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 the state of the water in Malaysia and uh, what is happening now and uh, for the outlook uh, report for both sewerage and water supply. And uh, we are selling it at a very special price of $105 per copy. And if you buy three copies or more, it's $95 a ringgit per copy. So we hope that you will, those who do not have this copy and you want to know more about Malaysia and the statistics of the water, the performance, Please take a, take, a, take a look at this book and, and call us if you want to buy this. Okay, uh, it's, a, you know, it's a very special uh, book that, that, that demonstrate all the, and share all the statistics of the water supply in Malaysia and the sewage services in Malaysia. Okay, next. Okay, this is the training course on the dam safety surveillance on the 25th to 26th of May. And so again, this is a very popular course. We had one in the past and it was very well uh, uh, attended. And this again, by this time you will, I think this one will be on a virtual uh, platform, I think. So, but this is on the HRDF claimable. So for those who are paying levy to the Human Resources Development <clears throat> Fund under the Ministry of Human Resources, you can attend this and you claim back all your money from the HRDF fund. So you, in fact, you'll be attending this course free huh? because you will be able to claim back all the fees from the HRDF uh, uh, protocol. Huh? Okay. The room chat is uh, to. Doctor Sari dah sampai dah. But now belum lagi lah Mr. Lee. Ah, belum lagi ya? Belum. Um, are we waiting or? Wait, let me see. Because he said can you do from the house? I say can. Why not? He uh, just was at me. Let's see whether he can. So sorry for the delay. All right, I can see our president, Dr. I.R. Haji Mama Asari is already in. Okay, but spotlight bagi. Yeah. Joe, can um, please spotlight to Dr. I.R. Haji Asari. Oh, I can't, I can't hear well. Can you hear me now? Am I supposed to speak? Pardon? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Boleh, eh? All right. Um, yes, I, yes. I guess we can start, yeah? 
Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings to Dr. I.R. Haji Muhammad Asari bin Dawood, MWA New President, Session 2123. Mr. John Rediford, CEO of Corrigamite Cashman Management Authority, our presenter today, Dr. I.R. Lim Chow Hock, former Director General, Department of Drainage and Irrigation Malaysia, press president of Institution of Engineers Malaysia and a former Commissioner of Spine. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to MWA Masterclass Series 03 2021, Transboundary Water Resources Management, the Murray Darling Basin Experience. Just the usual housekeeping before we start with today's presentation. Participants can use the chat box to identify your presence to others and say hello to friends and colleagues participating in the webinar. For Q&A, participant, participants are requested to use the chat box in the Zoom control panel or you can unmute and speak to get the attention of the speakers. But we request all of you to wait until the presenter finish the presentation for questioning. During the presentation, we will mute everyone to minimize interruption. We are also available on YouTube Live for viewing. Now, I'll pass the screen to Dr. I.R. Haji Muhammad Asari for his welcoming speech. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I hope uh, everyone can hear me. Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Amira, for the introduction. And uh, let me thanks everyone for being around for on this webinar. And of course, our gratitude to Mr. John Ridiford, willing to share his experience on the transboundary water resources management and of course uh, Dr. Lema for willingly uh, moderating this session. I can see more familiar faces unfortunately that we can't greet and meet each other nowadays. Hopefully in times to come we can actually meet up. The Tan Sri side, what is too, Kali and everyone uh, that uh, of course know MWA rather well, and it is our uh, master class series of the, th the, the third program. So it is uh, specially designed during this uh, pandemic so that we keep on uh, co collaborating and also sharing knowledge, even we are in these uh, difficult times. And for those who are driving, I wish you could be a bit more careful so that uh, you can uh, fully concentrate on driving. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, listening to Mr. John referred and also, of course, the moderation by Mr. Uh, Dr. Lim. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very interesting topic, transboundary water resources management, the Murray Darling experience. Uh, I have been uh, I went to Australia a few times, and of course, we have uh, some exposure to this Murray Darling uh, management system. So, however, I think uh, it goes back to something more uh, basic about the rules and responsibility, about rights and responsibility uh, in, in every catchment that we stay. So, transboundary rivers are increasingly being. Uh, catching the attention of engineers nowadays, of course, the politician, the social, the economy, the economists, and also uh, the, the socialists. So it is uh, very important that this situation need to be addressed. And also, of course, some moderation uh, is being given so that it will actually uh, make uh, water resources available to everyone so that we can actually meet everybody's needs. So MWA take this opportunity to arrange this class, uh, this master class lecture, and uh, to listen from, of course, uh, those very experienced from a global perspective and hope to draw 
some insightful international experience concept and also the challenges as far as sharing water resources are concerned. Of course, in this case, it's going to be among the states in, um, in Australia. However, I think uh, our speaker will be speaking a lot more than that. Of course, the international uh, transboundary also will not be forgotten, hopefully, because this is also vital as we also need to know a little bit more than just uh, one example of uh, transboundary management. So I'm very honored here to address in this, uh, for me, uh, inaugural webinar for me as a president of the Malaysian Water Association and uh, Mr. John. Uh, so, you know, I'm a bit nervous, of course, <laughs> and not familiar with webinar uh, thing, speaking alone in front of uh, my table. So it's, it's going to be a tough time for me. I'm going to cut short my, my, my address, but I must not forget to thank you very, very much, uh, John, for we see giving your time to us and sharing your experience. And everyone who are here, of course, that is the most important to me. So I don't think I should be a lot more on this uh, address, but uh, let us listen to Mr. John uh, Riddleford. And also, of course, I hope there will be interaction from, from the rest so that we can actually share our knowledge and experience together for the, uh, what we call that, uh, the betterment of this country, water resources management. So I really hope that uh, the experience shared in this will be uh, used uh, for our purposes and also learning from experience of the others. So last but not least, I would like to uh, invite all the participants to take this opportunity and with the presence of experts around to understand this subject and also uh, uh, what we call it, deliberate as much as we can. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. John Riddiford, also moderator, Dr. Lim Chao Hock, for being very kind to uh, be able with uh, uh, to attend this uh, program with the Malaysian Water Association. So with that, thank you very much. Amira, uh, the floor is yours again. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Haji Muhammad. Sorry. Now I would like to pass the screen to our moderator, Dr. I.R. Lin Chao Hock, to introduce our speaker and start with the webinar. Right. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Ms. Amira. Our Honorable uh, Mr. President of the Malaysian Water Association, Dr. Engineer Haji Muhammad Azari. Uh, Yang berbahagia Tan Sri Tan Sri, Datuk Datuk, ladies and gentlemen. A very good afternoon, good uh, perhaps evening, and maybe for some other part of the world. Good morning to all of you, uh, wherever you may be. I also take this opportunity to welcome all of you to this uh, MWA special uh, masterclass lecture on transboundary water resources management. As announced by the organizer just now, uh, Ms. Amira, uh, you may ask questions only towards the end of the presentation by our guest speaker. Uh, all right, all right. And uh, as also mentioned, uh, uh, I'll be drawing uh, questions. You can use a chat box, and uh, I also have perhaps allow the uh, live questioning as well. All right. For those who are uh, following on the YouTube or Facebook, your questions will be translated uh, by our secretary on the chat box, and I'll, I'll try to read them out for you. All right. Now, the, ladies and gentlemen, uh, according to the United Nations the Water, there are about 263 transboundary lake and river basins, which covers almost about half of the Earth's surface. Certainly, I think uh, all, all of you agree with me that cooperation is certainly very essential, especially among regions or countries where water security or, or scarcity is a major problem. More so, more so due to the impact, adverse impact of climate change. And uh, we know that the increasing demand due to populations and economic growth will require an integrated approach to the any transboundary water resources management based on appropriate legal and institutional framework, which can bring shared benefits to all the affected parties. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to uh, carry on with this because I'm going to ask all of you to and allow you to listen to our guest speaker who will share his vast experience on the management of the Mura Darling Basin, which is certainly a very interesting basin in Australia. 
And I noticed that they cut across four states, right? Like the case of we had in Malaysia, the states of, in, in Australia, the states of New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, and Queensland. And on a note, ladies and gentlemen, may I now take this opportunity to introduce to you our eminent speaker, Mr. John Relieford, for today's lecture. As mentioned by the president just now, uh, John currently works as a CEO of the Korangamite Catchment Management Authority in Australia. This uh, authority oversees integrated catchment program, river health program, environmental water management, and floodplain management. John is also the executive officer for the Victoria Catchments, representing the strategic interests of 10 regional Victorian catchment management authorities. And uh, he's also very active in the international scene. Currently, he's the uh, chair of the Watershed River Management Spe Specialist Group of the International Water Association. One of the key functions of this special interest group is to undertake best practice research into water resources management options for growing global cities under the threat of climate change. John is also a member of the expert review panel for the Australian Water Partnership, a joint venture between the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Cooperative Research Center for E-Water, which is support, which support its projects in basin develop, management and development in the India, Asia, and Pacific region. John has also extensive water and natural resource management experience, including his past roles as executive director at the Department of Environment and Primary Industries Water Group, and also as CEO of the Northeast Catchment Management Authority. Uh, John holds a bachelor degree in forest science, and currently he's also a fellow of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Ladies and gentlemen, we certainly had the right person uh, to speak to us on this very important, interesting topic on transboundary management of water resources. And uh, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to ask you to welcome uh, Mr. John Redford to give us a presentation. John, the screen is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lim Chow Hock. Uh, thank you also, Dr. Asari, for that uh, kind introduction. And also a big thank you to Mr. Lee and the Malaysian Water Association for the opportunity to speak about the Murray-Darling Basin system this afternoon. I shall now share my screen. And right, look. can you see that? Okay, I think it should be all right, John. Carry on. Right. Okay, I'm, I'm right to go. So thanks again for the Malaysian Water Association to speak about the Murray-Darling Basin uh, system in Australia. Just waiting for the next slide to pop up. Uh, so uh, here we've got a, a map of Australia showing all the states. So uh, in Australia under white settlement uh, occupied by English settlers and convicts from 1788 after the arrival of the first fleet, a number of colonies were formed, namely New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania. These colonies acted as their own fiefdoms with separate sovereign rights. This occurred from the establishment of the, from the first fleet from 1788 up until 1901. In 1901, Australia became a federated nation or, a, or what was known as and is known as the Commonwealth of Australia. As part of this uh, arrangement of the Commonwealth of Australia, a constitution was formed in 1901, and section 100 of the constitution of 1901 states that the Commonwealth shall not, by any law or regulation of trade or commerce, abridge the right of a state or the residents therein to be to the reasonable use of waters of rivers for conservation and irrigation. So what that meant is that the states reserved their rights for the management of water for their state's purposes. Uh, the Commonwealth of Australia uh, was a central funding agency which encouraged cooperation between the states for the use of those waters. 
So when you look at um, the Murray-Darling Basin itself, um, so it occupies a substantial part of the eastern part of the continent of Australia. Uh, the major cities of Australia are not generally included in the basin itself. So when you look at Sydney with a population of 5 million and Melbourne with a population of 5 million, they're not included in the basin, but have a very keen interest in the management of the basin and its waters. Adelaide, which is the capital of South Australia, is at the receiving end of the Murray-Darling Basin, is the mouth of the Murray River here. And Adelaide does rely very keenly on its water supply resources of the, of the Murray-Darling system. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the, the role of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and its future management and current management, it focuses on Australia's largest, most populous and most economically important river system in Australia. Rivers and their catchments are directly linked to their downstream estuaries and function and, uh, and coastal ecosystems and can, can have a major influence on the condition and functioning of these downstream systems. Additionally, estuarine and coastal systems are inhabited by nearly half of the world's human population. However, this is not the case for the Murray-Darling River system, which now has a small estuary at the bottom here and an important coastal lagoon system that has a low population and is managed mainly for environmental and tourism reasons in the lower reaches. Many of the world's estuarine and coastal systems increasingly confront enormous environmental challenges from multiple pressures which threaten their ecological and economic sustainability. These pressures include changes to catchment land use and hydrology, over-exploitation of surface and groundwaters, agriculture, pollution, eutrophication, harbour dredging, and climate change. A primary management and policy challenge is answering the question of how to maintain and protect the ecological structure and functioning of these river catchment systems. And at, at the same time, allow them to deliver the ecosystem services essential to the production of societal goods and benefits. To date, at the uh, International Water Association, we're not aware of any country that has successfully integrated the management of its land and water resources from catchment to coast. In the Murray-Darling Basin system, we've been attempting to do this for more than 120 years, and uh, we're certainly not there yet. The focus on the Murray-Darling Basin system is warranted, given its importance as one of Australia's largest catchment and also one of the most productive agricultural regions in the country. The Murray-Darling Basin contributes to almost 40% of Australia's irrigated production um, and, uh, and with a gross value of around US $6.5 billion. And the total agricultural production of this region is worth around US $20 billion per year. Additionally, the Murray-Darling Basin has extensive water-related environmental assets, including rivers, wetlands, floodplain forests, and we have more than 16 Ramsar-listed wetlands in the Murray-Darling Basin system. It also supports a rural and regional population of over 2.6 million people living in the basin, which is probably small scale compared to Malaysia. This also includes around 120,000 Aboriginal or First Nations people whose ancestors sustainably occupied the region for tens of thousands of years. When we look at the system and the river basin system, as mentioned before, the Murray-Darling Basin crosses four states. So we have Queensland to the north, New South Wales centrally, Victoria to the south, and South Australia as the receiving end of the waters and to the west. With each state having under the constitution, the right to manage water for domestic use, the right to manage water for agricultural use through irrigation, 
for industrial use and for the environment. In this slide, you can see the major irrigation districts highlighted in orange, and uh, they've been established uh, particularly in the Southern Basin system over the past 30, 40 years. And in the last 20 years, we've seen uh, an explosion of irrigation development in the Northern system. The MDB system consists of a very large catchment with a quite small coastal lagoon system. This is um, quite different to many other large river complex systems, such as the Mekong, the Mississippi, the Rhine, the Yangtze and the Ganges River, which tend to have much larger volumes of water and much larger delta systems at, uh, at, at the mouth of their major rivers. The changes to the Murray-Darling Basin over the 200 years since European colonisation and settlement has been extensive and include land clearing for agriculture in the 1800s, the displacement of the First Nations people, the Aborigines, water resource developments in the period between the 1900s and the 1990s, changed land use over allocation of water for irrigation, and I'll come back to that in a moment, and ongoing ecological degradation. A critical analysis of the water reforms in the Murray-Darling Basin over the past 30 years aimed at rebalancing the system and returning water to the environment. So basically, we clearly knew some 30 years ago that was serious over allocation of water, particularly for irrigation systems. And this led to very significant environmental degradation, uh, extinction of fish species, et cetera, which meant that we needed to look at rebalancing the system uh, less water for irrigation or more efficient water for irrigation and more water for environmental purposes. So we needed to do this in the sharing system between the states and overseen by the Australian Commonwealth Government. The, in addition, the multiple ways climate change already affects the basin and analysis of how a changing climate will be the major drive of change in the system over the next 30 years and beyond is another driver for serious change. The basin will become hotter and drier and governments, communities, industries and ecosystems will be faced with major challenges in, in adapting to these changes. Despite major water reforms in the Murray-Darling Basin over the last 30 years, there is still little in integration between the management of water resources, the broader catchment and interlinked policy issues, including regional development and agricultural structural change. Um, this, it's a little bit hard to read this slide, but, but I will go through this slide in some detail, but I'll break it up into sections so it's a little easier to read. Um, on the top, the blue uh, shadows, or the blue highlighted areas show the major flood events that's occurred since the, since the 1850s. And the uh, highlighted areas in orange show the major droughts that have occurred since the mid 1850s. Below the line, we see uh, the gray areas, which look at the major construction periods, um, the building of uh, irrigation development, the building of major storages. And in the bottom section and in the green section, we can see what the management and policy institutional changes have been made over that period of time. So if we look at this pathway to water reform, um, and I'm splitting these, the, the big slide into four slides now. Um, we can see here that in 1870 was the highest recorded flood ever for the Murray system since European settlement. And this followed a major, major drought from 1864, which lasted six years. This is very common in the Australian continental uh, experience where we have very serious droughts followed by very significant floods. And that volatility of rainfall and droughts and floods creates some unique challenges in terms of how we manage our water resources. And of course, if you look at this wetting and drying cycle, 
uh, the extremes will be further exacerbated by climate change, which is a very much a, a big challenge. Uh, coming up to present day and looking over the past 100 years, in uh, 1914, there were very severe droughts, which ended commercial navigation of, of river boats in the river systems. River barges were stranded. They were no longer used and they were replaced by uh, steam locomotives and by uh, trucks on roads. River boats never returned to the river system after 1914, except for some unique tourism opportunities. In 1981, drought forced Adelaide to take 90% of its water from the Murray River system, and it was of very poor quality, and the uh, local residents in Adelaide were very alarmed about their water resource security and the quality of their water. And at that time, the Murray Mouth closes for the first time in recorded history in 1981. In 2006, bottom right here, it was the lowest basin water inflows on record. So that uh, uh, exceeded any other drought in terms of um, inflows. So then when we look at um, uh, construction and uh, what happened in terms of uh, policy reform, in 1902, there was a major conference of heads of states and the Commonwealth to resolve competition for water between the states. This followed closely on the heels of the formation of the Australian Commonwealth Government and the formation of its constitution. And in fact, this, what we call the Corowa Conference of 1902, many people who were involved in writing the constitution for all forms of government processes in, the, in Australia were also involved in looking at how we resolve the issue of the sharing of water resources across the states. This resulted in 1914 with what was called the River Murray Waters Agreement signed in 1914, which allowed for the sharing of, of use of water across the states of New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. So when we look at policy reform over the past hundred or so years, in 1967, here, the River Murray Commission begins its first detailed study of irrigation, salinity and drainage. So up to this point, uh, the states had been allocating water rights for irrigation development in the main and for town development uh, without a view of a national systemized approach about what is a sustainable yield for that system and what's a sustainable allocation. In 1987, the MDB, the Murray-Darling Basin Agreement replaced the River Murray Water Agreement and looked more broadly at integrated catchment principles rather than the, than the river channels themselves. In 2007 was a watershed year. Uh, there was a national crisis of low flows within the Murray-Darling Basin system. There was a national crisis in terms of uh, uh, irrigators not getting any allocation uh, for water for their uh, irrigated produce. There was also a national crisis in the, in the sense that the states and the broader community were losing confidence in the governance systems in the Murray-Darling Basin. And there was a national crisis from the environmental movement to saying that uh, because of the overallocation of water and the unfair uh, take of water compared to environmental needs was a lead leading to an environmental disaster. So all of these things in 2007 led our then Prime Minister, John Howard, to say to uh, have a special conference and to say that there is a crisis within the Murray-Darling Basin and it needs to be fixed. And therefore, the Commonwealth will be drawing up a legislation specifically to deal with the Water Act, and specifically to deal with the Murray-Darling Basin and to auspice the development of a Murray-Darling Basin plan. And together with that, he put uh, around $10 billion US equivalent on the table for that to be done. In 2012, um, the Basin Plan became law, but 
there is still some confusion between the implementation of that plan between the Commonwealth of Australia and the states. A little hard to read, but this is the basin uh, implementation timeline. Um, so we look at the, in 2012, the basin plan passed into law. We had water trading rules begin between states in 2014. We had the Basin Environmental Watering Strategy published, long-term state environmental watering plans published in 2015, uh, uh, groundwater reviews completed, constraints projects began, uh, initial environmental water recovery completed, sustainable diversion limits come into effect. Effectively, um, in in the early 1980s, there was a cap of water diversion in the Murray-Darling Basin system. So that meant that there was no new licenses for taken use of water issued after the cap was introduced. And the concept of sustainable diversion limits was uh, uh, thought about in the 2012 plan, which was to look at what volume of water needs to be returned to the Murray system uh, to ensure its uh, environmental viability and to ensure the economic vi viability of the um, irrigation industry. That decision led to 2,750 extra gigalitres needed to be allocated to the river system. And that was to be derived by principally uh, development of greater efficiency of irrigation development so that uh, with that efficiency dividend that would be transferred to an environmental uh, water right. And also additionally, the Commonwealth went into the water market to buy water as an entitlement for purposes for environmental flows. So that's, that's the nub of the basin plan and there's a timeline for implementation. The key outcomes of the plan is that we have a water recovery target of the original 2,750 gigalitres targeted, 77% has been recovered. Combined with the sustainable diversion limit adjustment outcome, water recovery is nearly complete in most regions and the amount of buybacks has been less than originally expected. So we have a transition period for the sustainable diversion limits and that's uh, in progress, but not being implemented as fast as we would like. And so the outcome here is at risk. Each of the states were required under the basin plan to develop water resource plans to be accredited by 2019. Some of those plans have been delayed by some four to five years. Environmental water, uh, the, the Commonwealth uh, introduced legislation as part of the 2000 legislation, 2007 legislation, to create the Office of the uh, Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder. And that statutory office has the authority, the power and the resources to purchase water on the open market and has management responsibility to deliver environmental water released ostensibly from the major storages. Uh, we have water quality is being managed across the basin. Salinity targets have been met in four out of the five locations. Uh, Blue-green algal blooms are in the main being held, but that's not to say we won't have future issues with blue-green algae. Uh, compliance, we've had some issues in some states where there's been active theft of water from the river systems, and this has led to uh, decreased flows downstream, of course. There's been a number of reviews and adjustments as, as we go along with the implementation of the plan and the development of the markets has been quite sophisticated where we're removing barriers for trade, where we allow the movement of water, particularly irrigated water, to those commodities that uh, provide better economic uh, gain but, and also using less water. Um, this... These graphs here clearly show some of the issues that we face in, in Australia. So if we look at um, Ireland in this, these graphs here in the bottom middle, and we look at the uh, system in terms of uh, 
the Murray-Darling Basin and compare those two. So if you look at the relative rainfall anomaly, or in other words, the variability of rainfall in Ireland, it is much more stable than, say, in the Murray-Darling Basin system, where some years we have relatively high rainfall and other years very, very low rainfall, which leads to years and years of drought followed by a year or two of floods. Then if you look at the precipitation rates, you have consistency and high values for precipitation in Ireland and in the Murray-Darling Basin, relatively much lower levels of precipitation. Then if you look at the, um, at the annual inflows of the Murray-Darling Basin system, you can see that that volatility happening over the decades whereby um, in some periods of time, the, the means can change quite substantially. And in fact, what happened in, in this period of time here in the 50s is that we had relatively high rainfall period over a decade. And uh, that relative rain, relatively ra large rainfall occurred right through to 2000. And of course, we use as engineers and scientists uh, and water resource planners, we, have, we use that information to design and plan for our future water resource options, including the use of groundwater, the construction of dams. And um, it, didn't really, it didn't factor in uh, climate change and that, that whole rainfall volatili volatility. So that, that led to some uh, interesting challenges from a water resource management point of view. And then in this middle, middle bottom graph here, you can see large dams built in the Murray-Darling Basin Reservoir by volume by the year completed. And um, when I was uh, having a chat with uh, uh, both Dr. Lim Chow Hock and Dr. Asari before, um, the, 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 uh, oh, sorry, it was uh, one of your former presidents of the Malaysian Water Association who come to Australia in the 1960s and was looking at some of the larger constructions on the um, Murrumbidgee River in New South Wales. And there was two major storages blowering and upstream of blowering created in that period of time. The Hume Dam around 3,000 uh, gigalitres was created in this period of time in the 30s. Uh, in Victoria, we had the Eildon Reservoir built at just over 3,000 gigalitres and then Dartmouth Reservoir at just over 4,000 gigalitres. So those, the sizes of those storage is quite significant when you consider that the main annual flow of the Murray-Darling system is around 15,000 megalitres, gigalitres per year. Uh, but certainly in the past 10, 20 years has dropped significantly to below 10,000 gigalitres a year. So the relative size of the storage is high compared to the annual yield. Another interesting thing is the population density over the, over the system. So as I mentioned before, Sydney, 5 million people, Melbourne, 5 million people. But when you get into the basin itself, the population density is quite sparse with only 2.5 million people within the basin itself. This actually leads to some issues in terms of adaptive capacity. So we're, we're in the middle of major reform in terms of the irrigation industry, in terms of those rural towns, in terms of environmental management in the whole system. And when you have... Um, uh, sophisticated urban populations like we do in Canberra, we have, and, and also people with wealth and resources, we have a greater adaptive capacity for those uh, structural reforms and change. Where we have more sophisticated irrigation systems using uh, uh, latest technology, uh, latest information in terms of how they best manage their industries and properties and most efficient way of delivering their water needs, you have above average capacity to deliver on those reforms. But where you have less sophisticated uh, people uh, reluctant to uptake technology, then you have a lower adaptive capacity. And where you have in the far west people with 
uh, that are of a lower socioeconomic background and have limited resources to spend on technology and upgrading their systems, you have even less, you have an even less adaptive capacity for that structural reform that's required. When we look at the um, governance uh, of the current governance arrangements of the Murray-Darling Basin, so we have a, a, a statutory framework uh, as such. So the overarching legislation is the Water Act of 2007, and that auspices uh, uh, the Murray-Darling Basin Agreement between the states and the Commonwealth. We have the Basin Plan of 2012, which then auspices the states to produce their water resource plans. And we have a Basin State Water legislation, uh, which reflects the Water Act and the Murray-Darling Basin Plan itself. Embedded in that, we have water trading rules, environmental watering plan, water quality management plan, and other matters, including criteria for water resource plans. And when you look at the institutional arrangements, we have a federal environment minister who has a responsibility to oversee the, uh, the workings of the Commonwealth environmental water holder. And then we have the federal water minister which oversees the federal water, the department, and also the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. Feeding into the Murray-Darling Basin Authority is what we call the Ministerial Council. So that is uh, made up of the federal and basin state ministers, and they have oversight of the Basin Officials Committee, which has the authority and the delegated authority to oversee the day-to-day -day operations of the river systems in the Murray-Darling Basin system. I was actually a member of the Basin Officials Committee in 2010 to 2012. So, uh, as I mentioned before, one of the key aspects of the Basin Plan un uh, under the legislative aus auspices of the, um, of the Water Act of 2007 is to redress the balance of over allocation of irrigated water and to look at having some environmental entitlements as such through the system. And these are some of the uh, uh, major initiatives um, to, for that to occur. So that is that the, the Living Murray initiatives was looking at uh, the artificial watering of major environmental assets throughout the basin. The act uh, enshrined the establishment of the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder and the basin plan takes effect. So when you look at some of the examples of, of those uh, key environmental water reforms is that in drought, we have a, 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 a within the plan, we have a main, object, main objective to protect our river systems to avoid critical loss. In drier periods, we have a main objective of maintaining river functioning with reduced uh, reproductive capacity. Uh, in average conditions, our main objective is to recover our river systems by improving ecological health and resilience. And in wet periods, we have a major objective in enhancing by restoring key floodplain and wetland linkages through those various plans. What I'd like to do now is um, demonstrate one of the, the key issues um, there's two, two key issues about transboundary river basin management. The first is about governance and allocation. And the second is regarding the impacts resulting from cumulative externalities and management arrangements. And uh, I wanted to demonstrate this latter point with a major event that happened in, in January 2019. And it was um, uh, claimed by the national media press as a, as a national disaster, environmental disaster. So in early 2019, we had a major incident in Menindee Lake, which is halfway down the Darling system, where we had over a million fish died in a very short period of time, over a 48 hour period of time, we had over a million fish dying in a 40 kilometer stretch of river. And we had all, all sorts of other consequences too, in relation to the drought, and, you know, the drowning of, well, the, the, uh, unfortunately, our national emblem, the kangaroo, uh, dying in a receding uh, lake there. Uh, I, I want, I'll just go through in a little bit of detail what happened here. 
The Lower Darling was subject to three tra tragic fish death events in December 2018 and January 2019. The large fish death events covered a 40 kilometre stretch of the Darling River downstream of Menindee Lakes. The Darling River and its tributaries cover approximately 1,100 kilometres. This is about half of New South Wales and one tenth of Queensland. The main trunk of the river system rises in the Great Dividing Range closer to the border of New South Wales and Queensland and travels south southwest for 2,700 kilometres before it empties into the Murray at Wentworth. This makes it the longest river in Australia. Along this river system are some of Australia's significant rural communities, large industries, vital lakes and wetlands. Due to its flat nature and variable rainfall across the area, flows into the Darling system are much more variable than other systems in Australia. Over a million fish died in this particular event. The key causes were extremely large numbers of juvenile and mature fish in the Menindi Lake system and the river channel due to two major high flow events in 2012 and 16. When the lakes are full, they are significant nursery habitats for fish. And due to these high flow events, there was a substantial increase in numbers of fish living in the Bow and Darling. In other words, a very large biomass. Subsequent to 2016, drought conditions in the Northern Basin have had major impact of inflows. There were no further inflows into Menindee Lakes. Low or no flows combined with extended hot and dry weather conditions resulted in poor water quality issues. Algal blooms developed over time and by late November 2018, water quality in the Lower Darling reached a red alert level. Abrupt reductions in air temperature and increased wind associated with storms caused their weir pools to be suddenly destratified resulting in low oxygen water and no escape for the fish. In 2018 was the eighth driest year on record in that area. The low level of rainfall sustained over the past two year period in the Murray-Darling Basin has only occurred twice since 1900. 2018 was also the hottest year on record for New South Wales and the Murray-Darling Basin and the second hottest year Australia-wide. Persistently high temperatures and high winds throughout the year contributed to record rates of, of observed evaporation for winter and spring in New South Wales and Queensland, compounding low river inflows. For four successive days at Menindi, the top temperature did not drop below 45 degrees C. And one day, on one day, it recorded a top temperature of 48 degrees C. That, that these were unheard of and unseen uh, precedents in terms of those extreme temperatures. New South Wales river systems typically receive 4,000 gigalitres of inflows each year. And in the first uh, six months of the water year in 2018, they only received 30 gigalitres of inflows, less than 1% for that year. Just in summary, what happened was that the um, floods of 2012 triggered a fish response. So there was a massive bloom in biomass. In the subsequent years, there was a drastic re reduction of inflows. So the comparative fish biomass to volume of water uh, was increasing dramatically. So the fish biomass was uh, maintaining steady levels, but the volume of water was rapidly decreasing. There was major blue-green algal blooms, which caused stress in the fish. A particularly hot period or further stress the fish uh, with those 45, 48 degree days. And then a cool change came through with uh, cooler winds and, um, and also gale force winds, which caused the lakes and the river channel to invert and, and to stratify. So the anoxic water at the bottom of the, the lake and the river became to the top of the water where the fish normally swim. And they, uh, uh, as a result of the anoxic water and the stress factors, previous stress factors, uh, the fish um, died in a very quick period of time as such. And that caused a major concern nationally about how we manage our river systems. Uh, the next slide just shows uh, briefly um, the, the, the relative allocations to, for irrigation compared to the environment. So before the environmental water holder was uh, created uh, in 2012, the environmental allocations had no rights, so they had zero allocation. 
and there were rights for irrigators to, to irrigate. So over this period of time, you can see the water available for irrigation and then water available for environment with the creation of the environmental water holder. With climate change predictions, um, it was stated that uh, under climate change, water available for irrigation may drop by um, 10 to 15% over the next 50 years, but environmental allocations may drop by 50% over the next 30 to 50 years. So even more need for uh, to ensure the rights for the environment. So this is uh, the, the second last slide. Um, I just wanted to talk about uh, some conclusions here. In summary, I've provided a brief introdu introduction of the Murray-Darling Basin System. Uh, first covered are the Australian system of government and the long involvement of the Commonwealth both in, and Basin State Governments in the planning and management of our water resources in this transboundary system. Uh, the irrigated agriculture industry in the MDB is important, but due to over allocations and over extraction of consumptive water by the irrigation industry, there has been significant environmental degradation. The growing awareness of the environmental degra degradation has, re has resulted in a number of major water reforms in water management in the Murray-Darling Basin since the early 1990s. These include the cap on further water allocations in 1995, the National Water Initiative in 2004, the Commonwealth Water Act in 2007, and the Basin Plan in 2012. The Basin Plan initiated through the Water Act seeks to ensure that the water resources of the Murray-Darling Basin are managed as an integrated and a sustainable way to achieve a healthy working Murray-Darling Basin that support strong and vibrant communities, resilient industries, including food and fibre production, and a healthy environment. To achieve this, the plan is introducing sustainable diversion limits, which will recover consumptive water for the environment, a basin-wide environmental watering strategy, a water quality and salinity management strategy, new regional water resource plans, enhanced water trading rules, and monitoring and evaluation. So what, what, what does, does this all mean? We've still got some confusion about who's responsible for leading implementation, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority or Basin Governments. There is some uncertainty about who should respond to these issues and the risks aren't necessarily strategically managed. And it's difficult for stakeholders to navigate institutional arrangements and management. So Basin governments have agreed that we need to direct the implementation through a whole of Basin approach and the Basin plan aims to achieve that. And that the ministerial council, so that council with the state and federal ministers uh, need to ensure that they are the stewards of water resources in the plan. And certainly there is a big commitment for that. The authority, the central authority created by the Australian government, Commonwealth government, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority has two key clear roles. One as an agent, as a trusted advisor, helping governments implement the plan and manage the shared resources. And as a plan regulator, which ensures states and indeed itself complies with the plan. Um, just in closing, this is a, a reference document for further reading. Um, I, I can assure you it's probably not as good as value as the, the, the journals and the, uh, uh, and the the publications that were advertised at the start of this session. It is a bit expensive at 150 US dollars, but the uh, editors, um, Echo Hydrology from Catchment Coast, have commissioned a number of uh, reports on river systems of great ecological and socioeconomic importance, including the Nile in Africa, the Mekong in Southeast Asia, the Scheldt, in Northwest Europe, the Columbia River in North, Northern America, and this book, The Murray-Darling Basin, Australia, Its Future Management. Thank you again, Dr. Lim Chao Hock. Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, kind words and introduction. Um, and, I'm, and through you, I'm happy to take questions and once again, appreciate the opportunity to talk about the Murray-Darling Basin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, John, for that uh, very interesting and uh, com comprehensive uh, uh, 
explanations on the river darling district uh, management. I think, uh, obviously, I think you have touched on uh, quite a lot of pertinent points, right from the legislation and the necessary the water reform and transformations until the present stage. And uh, you mentioned about also the establishment of the, uh, the necessary legislation in 2007 on the Water Act and followed by the 2008 uh, um, more darling basin agreements among the various uh, states. At the same time, I think the formations of all the various uh, so-called institutional arrangement to handle the basin. Uh, obviously, I think your conclusion does uh, leave question mark in terms of who take the leads in terms of the issues arise. But let me, before you answer all these questions, I just want to uh, perhaps uh, uh, relate to questions on the chat box first, all right? And if I may, I will just follow the uh, so-called uh, the chronological order for whoever type first a check box, I will try to go through the question. Is that right? Okay. Uh, I, we do receive quite, and perhaps I think uh, uh, John will try to answer most of them, all right? Uh, there's a question from, uh, I can see here, by the name of, uh, uh, let me see, uh, it was related to M. Let me see. Yes, uh, WW, uh, it just say that uh, what are the design hiatograph, the design hiatograph used in Australia, or for this case, the Murray Darling Basin? Uh, John, when you address this question first, what kind of design hiatograph that was used? This is a hydrological question, sir. Okay, yep. Um, right. I'm, I'm not an expert uh, hydrologist per se, but we, uh, in terms of the, the basin plan, there are a number of models that are used to determine uh, the flow characteristics of uh, the river systems as such. There was a particular um, a hydrographical model called Big Mod, um, a big river system model um, that was used, that was internally derived and created through um, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. Uh, having said that, um, through our Cooperative Research Centre for eWater, uh, there are a number of hydrological models that um, uh, that have been used uh, in the basin states as such. Mm -hmm. I might have to get on notice in terms of the specific hydrological models that have been used, and I'm happy to, to refer that on. Right. Okay. I'm, I'm sure that I think, um, like most cases, I think for purpose of uh, uh, design, uh, the appropriate uh, hydrograph that has been actually been used uh, basing on the hydrograph that has been developed for a different kind of uh, uh, basin characteristic. I'm sure you have that. Perhaps I think uh, that can easily refer to some of the technical the hydro hydrological the, uh, references. Huh? Right. Yep. Yep. Now, the, I, I let, yes, I'd like to go on, to on the, the other part of uh, questions from uh, Engineer Lee Kun Yu. Uh, she captured it from the YouTube. There's a YouTube uh, uh, questions. Is there any mechanism within the basin framework for downstream state to pay direct state for catchment maintenance and opportunity loss for catchment development? And if not, why are these states able to accept the no money compensation? John, you want to address this interesting questions? The issues of compensation. Sorry, right. sorry to interrupt just for a bit. Um, do you mind, um, John, do you mind um, stop sharing the screen so your... You and that will appear on the screen. All right. Okay. Uh, All right. Yes. Uh, okay. Better. Okay. Thanks. All right. That will be easy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Ah. Uh, yeah. So right. that. That. So yes, I just want to come back to this question, John. Yes. Yeah. That. That indeed okay. is. Yes. John, carry on. Sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, it was a bit, uh, the voice get a bit broken. Okay, we may proceed now. It'll be much better okay, now. Okay. Right. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. So that, that is indeed an excellent question about um, uh, downstream states. There, there are rights and responsibilities for compensation and also the ability to pay for uh, catchment improvements further upstream. And in fact, South Australia uh, historically and politically have said that um, the reasonably in, in, in heated dispute with the upstream states to say that 
they have been mismanaged um, and consequently there's poor water quality in South Australia. The mouth of the Murray often closes over when before um, mm-hmm. uh, 18, uh, 1980, it, it, it very infrequently closed over. And that um, the upstream states are over allocating water, which means that there's very low inflow into South Australia. And in fact, uh, recent, as recently as 18 months ago, they set up a Royal Commission of Inquiry in the mismanagement of the Murray-Darling Basin and the other state mm-hmm. refused to uh, face up to court in, in that system. So then when you look at the, the structure of the Commonwealth of Australia, what happens is that uh, uh, the, the Commonwealth of Australia has a central taxation system through uh, the goods and services tax and through personal income and uh, corporate tax. So then they have the resources to implement the plan and uh, through MINCO, through the Ministerial uh, Co um, uh, Forum and Committee, they have the authority to distribute the resources to make effect to the plan and to ensure that we have um, irrigation efficiency upgrade systems installed, ensure that we have processes and systems to allow for that environmental water to reach the environmental assets of where they need to be targeted and Mm. to give effect to compensation for um, uh, where particular individuals, landholders, industry groups have been disaffected by um, lower allocations of irrigation where we've had that structural reform. So it's actually the responsibility of the Commonwealth Government to uh, attribute that uh, funding to allow for that structural reform to occur. The states individually um, will advocate for certain processes, but really don't have that clout like the Commonwealth Government does through its um, taxation system. I see. So there's a kind of mechanism that actually being practiced now within the uh, Murray Darling Basin. And then this compensation to, uh, of, of uh, paying to the uh, upstream doesn't arise, right? Uh, effect, effectively not. It's, it's a centralised pool of funding to give effect to the plan. Mm-hmm. I see. All right. Can I move to the next question from uh, Ms. Ponita uh, referring to uh, you, you did actually answer this in your uh, conclusion, John, but I think uh, perhaps uh, uh, this this addressing again, referring to 2008 agreement in relation to the Mura Basin uh, 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 plan, uh, uh, sorry, the act uh, agreement and what are the challenges and how they address it. Is it is, especially written in the 2008 uh, uh, water agreement, basin agreement? Uh, yep. So the um, 2007 Water Act gave, gave effect to the basin plan, which was developed in 2012, but in 2008 was called the Murray-Darling uh, Agreement um, and effectively uh, MINCO. So That's the right. Ministers and the Federal Minister gave effect to, to that agreement which looked more broadly at uh, integrated catchment management principles than than purely uh, um, uh, water allocation processes. So that looked at uh, water quality. It looked at salinity, which is a a big issue in Australian waterways. Um, And it looked at the establishment of the Commonwealth Environmental Holder and and other matters. And also Mm -hmm. uh, looked at uh, a research and science investigations unit to look at integrated catchment management best practice, which would allow for uh, appropriate uh, sustainable natural resource management in the broader catchment areas. So the lead for that was MINCO or Ministerial Council, the state and federal ministers, and the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and their officers um, were charged with the job of, of drafting up those documents. I see, I see. So, but uh, right, right at the low down scale, it's under the piece in terms of uh, uh, looking at all the issues at the ground. They have addressed all the issues and 
ground under the basin officials committee you have that uh, committee here, right under the ministerial council below the ministerial council uh, you have the basin official committee and this basin of officiality are they responsible to actually to address the issues that actually arise apart from the john uh, i said that the basin official committee will be amended to address can you hear uh, me john yeah you're cutting out a little bit uh, amira are you hearing all of that question amira uh, no i'm sorry he's actually breaking up a bit yeah but i, I can yeah, i can read the chat box so um I wasn't quite sure which question it was in the chat box. Amira, are you able to say? Yeah, which? I'm. I'm on the chat box too. Okay. Um, which which question was he asking just now? <laughs> My voice is going <laughs> From who? Yeah, um, Dato. From uh, from it was from uh, from actually, I, I'm just following up from Ponita. He said. Okay. Um. Oh, from Punita is. I'm sorry, Dato. Your line is breaking up. Mora Basin, who take the lead, is it? And what are the challenge? And how? Yeah. Uh uh, what I might do, um, Amira and uh, and Lim, is uh, I'll I'll quickly go through the chat box questions and then um, pull me up if I'm get, going astray. Is that is that okay? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's great. Yeah, okay. that's okay. So uh, I, I in my previous answer, I did talk about um, to the, referring to the 2000 agreement. Who took the lead? Um, so that's I think I've answered that question. What are the key factors to ensure sustainability of the transboundary management? The, the key factors for, for us is the basin plan itself, uh, the legislative uh, uh, support for the basin plan, both through the Water Act in, in the Australian government, as well as the supporting basin uh, states water acts that, that must give reference to the basin plan. Uh, and also having that uh, central, centralised pool of funding to allow for the expenditure of prioritised projects. So as I mentioned in my presentation, the then Prime Minister John Howard uh, uh, provided $13 billion Australian for the implementation of the plan. And there's still a requirement for the Basin States and the Australian Government to pull their resources for the implementation of the plan. So it's both the legislation and the resourcing that allows for the sustainability of the transboundary management issues. And how and what does it take to ensure everyone abide by the agreement? Now, that is a very good question. When you looked at the first River Murray agreement between the four states and the Commonwealth, if any of the states, if one of the states or the Commonwealth disagreed with what was being proposed, then that wouldn't happen. So it was all by... 100% uh, consensus, and that led to very slow structural reform. Uh, the current plan uh, uh, it really uses the, the power of money to ensure implementation. The problem is we don't have a good compliance system. Uh, we now have a national inquiry um, by an independent commissioner to look at how we better uh, support compliance systems both with the authority and the states. And that is a definite weakness in the plan. Uh, it's uh, we're supposed through this independent review, we're hoping that there will be better compliance measures in the near future. Uh, the basin report card concept and monitoring across the states. So basically we have we do have compliance reports for uh, for each year against the cap, that's no longer in play. It's the implementation of the basin plan report that occurs on an annual basis and every five years there's a major review of the plan itself. Uh, in terms of the report 
cards themselves, they tend to be uh, under the state jurisdiction. So we have uh, four report cards rather than one major report card. Uh, does the Murray-Darling Basin face seawater intrusion uh, in the lower lakes? Um, the, it, it has been uh, contended that the lower lakes were mainly freshwater systems. Uh, they are now mainly seawater systems. So the incursion occurs only within the lower lakes and not within the broader system. Having said that, we do have salinity problems uh, in the Murray-Darling Basin system, which is based on groundwater problems rather than seawater incursion. Um, water trading is between beneficiaries uh, and polluters. Uh, water trading is uh, done between beneficiaries and not polluters. So uh, again, a very good question is that uh, there's no there's no real compliance system about um, uh, pol polluting bodies as such. Um, obviously, if we can identify specific industries, then we will um, use the Environment Protection Agency to use their powers to, to uh, rectify that situation. But in terms of diffuse pollution, um, there, there is, isn't a, a, a mechanism to address that at a broader scale. Uh, next, in the Water Act, how does the states decide how much they can abstract from the Murray-Darling Basin? So that's through the state water resource plans. So those water resource plans feed into the Murray-Darling Basin plan. As I said in my presentation, um, the states were committed to develop their water resource sharing plans in, by 2019. Uh, Victoria has completed theirs, New South Wales completed theirs, South Australia hasn't completed theirs yet, and neither has Queensland. But those state water resource plans uh, decide how much can be yeah. abstracted. Yeah. The is, Water Act, how does the state decide how much they can abstract from the Murray Darling Basin? So that's through the state water resource plans. So those water resource plans feed into the Murray Darling Basin plan. As I said in my presentation, Joe. Uh, to develop their water resource sharing plans by 2019. Uh, Victoria has completed their, South Wales completed their, South Australia has Joe. completed their, Queensland. Joe, help me Water resource plans. Mm -hmm. Can you all hear me now? I'm, I'm so sorry with all this uh, internet uh, connection. Yes, yes, from, we can hear you now. Um, but it's still breaking up a bit. I'm so sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm very sorry that uh, John has to read the, the question himself. <laughs> but I think your your line is still breaking still up. Still breaking up. Uh, all yeah, the, I'm so sorry. Uh, the question himself. Uh, um, can hello? you still help me? Still breaking up. Uh? Yeah. I'm very, very sorry. Much better, much better. It's much better. Now, uh, is there any question that your participant post on any any questions? I, much better. But uh, I have most of the questions uh, I can get uh, from the chat box. Uh, now I'll probably like to. Uh, I'll open the question for online. If there is any questions online? Please. Hello. Um, can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, so, okay. Um, is there any question from the floor? I mean, if you want to speak up, please unmute or raise your head. Um, wait, do we have the raise hand here? Tan Sri, Tan Sri Sai, Tan Sri Sai, yeah. Tan Sri Sai. All right. Um, okay. Tan Sri Sai would like to have I, a question. All right. Um, okay, Tan Sri Sai. Right. Um, wait, yeah. Um, um, Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I can it's, see Anifa. It's, 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 it's already no? written there. Um, it's sharing, sharing of water is, is also sharing of cost. Now, um, cost for management. Um, is this being shared or being implemented 
or being done for all the basin, the four basin states in Australia. And therefore, um, is there any, um, the basic thing is uh, what benefit, what benefit would the four states get in the end, uh, in term, in financial terms? Uh, thank, thank you. you for, that, thank you for that question. Um, it's the sharing of water is also the right. cost, and um, what what do the states as beneficiaries get out of uh, out of that arrangement? Um, so under the uh, agreements, um, uh, there is a pooled resource uh, from the Commonwealth and from the states. Uh, the Living Murray. What was called the Living Murray in 2000, which started in 2010, uh, looked at, uh, uh, for example, looked at a um, a 60 million dollar program of which half of that total pool was committed by the Commonwealth government, and half of that pool was committed by the individual states, um, with New South Wales and Victoria being the main beneficiaries or the main uh, suppliers of, of that funding. So the the, the benefits that the states get is um, they'll get structural works, uh, constructed works, which might be in environmental assets. It might be uh, dams and storages. It might be uh, off-stream dams and storages. It might be um, greater efficient irrigation systems uh, as an investment in the infrastructure within that particular state. So it is a pooled um, investment process uh, and then a prioritisation process through Minco Council and then, um, uh, uh, and then under the legislation where those targets have to be met um, that are, that are uh, outlined within the basin plan. So it's a pooled investment and, uh, and, and with the goodwill of the state governments to say that they will benefit, but they're doing it for the benefit of the greater basin and the nation itself. Thank you. Right, thank you, Mr. Bitford. Um, now, can I pass to the, um, Prof. Hanifa, please? Hi, Mira, thanks. Yes. Uh, hi, right. John. Right. Hanifa here. Uh, I've actually come across uh, this Murray Darling uh, you know, uh, many times and I've personally also visited, you know. But what still bugs me is, you know, uh, I mean, as an authority, you know, you took about 100 right. years to set it up. Uh, but still yet, the focus is very much on water within that uh, catchment, you know. So I'm just wondering, you know, uh, within this Murray Darling Basin, uh, who is the ultimate uh, party who is responsible for the well-being of the environment itself? Say there's uh, air pollution, solid waste management pollution, and something, of course, if it discharges to the streams, uh, there's adequate, you know, uh, 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 papers which I've read about, you know, but who is the actual authority who is responsible for the environment within this basin? Uh, the, the, the short answer to that question are the states. Uh, the states have the constitutional right and the authority to, to manage land and water is resources. And so the, individually, the states have, uh, environmental protection authorities and so forth, which license uh, sewage discharge and those sorts of things. The, the, the longer answer is that um, uh, the, when the Murray-Darling Basin Authority was formed in the early 2000s, they were looking at greater uh, aspects of the, of the basin system as a connected catchment basin system, where they did look at water quality and relationships with sewage treatment plants in relation to pollution discharge points. They looked at salinity. They looked at vegetation in terms of uh, retention of vegetation on, on land. Uh, that focus quickly disappeared when we had these, what we call the millennium drought from 1998 to 2010, when we had critically low water uh, um, supplies and, uh, and very significant water shortages to the point where um, the city of Melbourne was looking like it was going to run out of water uh, as part of that overall drought. Um, we had 0% allocations to the irrigation industry. So the focus went, it was very sharply put towards water and water allocation. And those other elements were being thought about were then disregarded as a, as a low priority. 
Um, back to your original question, the states clearly have the responsibility for all of those other matters and have a clear responsibility to report to their constituents how that's being managed. Um, it, it's hard to say what's going to happen in terms of a fully integrated system in the much longer term. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, explanation. Uh, meaning that you know the authority will still have to go back to the state to resolve the environmental issues, yes. rather than the authority itself, you know, uh, uh, has the powers to resolve it themselves. Not, not at this point, no. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Thank you. All right, thank you, Prof. Anifa. Um, can I pass it to Ms. Punita, who raised her hand on the screen also? Um, hi, Mr. Jen. I hope you can hear me, because I'm driving right now. Is the line clear? Line is clear. Okay, Just great. So I have a question. I would like to know how much public uh, engagement or uh, consideration, their feed, uh, the consideration for their feedback is given when... Um, the basin is actually planned, the needs for the basin as well as management of the basin. And how frequently do you engage with public and how much does it matter in your uh, course of work? Yep. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, th there, there is a national push both through central government and through state governments that community engagement and um, public engagement for major policy change and reform, structural reform must be undertaken. And in fact, um, there's a number of pieces of legislation, both in the states and the Commonwealth, that uh, public engagement, public consultation must be undertaken with any uh, institutional reform process. Uh, with the development of the Murray Darling Basin Plan, I'd say it's one of the. Thank you for that question. Um, there, there is a national push, both through central government and through state governments, that community engagement and uh, public engagement for. Um, Amira, I'm having a slight problem. I'm, it seems like I'm being recorded and then it's being thrown back at me. I'm not sure what's happening there. I think someone actually unmuted your mic and it accidentally um, by watching both YouTube. Let me ask Johari to mute everyone again. Johari? Yep. Um, please mute everyone again, except for Apani. Can I, uh, I, I uh, guess... Amira, can you hear me now? Uh, um, I can hear you, but... Um, hello? I think Amira, let Tato Lim take over first. Huh? Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah can, can. Can you, yeah. right? All right, my, my screen seems to be coming on and off. That is a thousand apology once again. Uh, right, uh, I think uh, certainly, I think John you did answer most of the questions. And uh, just now there was uh, questions by engineer Hanifa on, the, uh, on these issues of the, the other environmental issues and who, who as you rightly answered, the, the, the state has still had to address it from the environmental agencies. Uh, what about uh, other natural resources person within the... Uh, the uh, Darling Basin itself, uh, other natural resources like uh, mining, for instance, or uh, land clearing for uh, some other uh, 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 new new land to be for, for irrigation or agriculture. Uh, does this fall within the Basin Authority or does it fall under the other line agencies? John? Uh, thank you. Mining, for especially in Australia. Yep. Thank you for that question. So uh, uh, just to close off on um, Ponita's uh, question is that there, there has to be extensive community consultation in the development of the plan, and mm. um, that, that clearly done. Uh, so in terms of other resources and other impacts on, on the basin itself, um, mining is, is, is clearly a, a, a big issue, as, and particularly in relation to uh, fracking for gas uh, in groundwater systems is, is a very, very big issue, political issue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, in relation to land clearing uh, uh, in Victoria, there's no opportunity for your future land clearing under its state obligations and legislation. In Queensland, there is still land clearing occurring um, and they're mm -hmm. trying to look at some uh, um, 
uh, resolve in terms of uh, limiting land clearing. And there's certainly land clearing done in northern New South Wales, but not in southern New South Wales. Uh, land use change uh, is a big factor in terms of uh, different irrigation development. So we've seen rice and cotton in some areas being transferred to um, chestnuts and almonds in certain areas, and that has had some unintended consequences in security of water supply. So land use change is an issue. Uh, Urbanisation is an issue on the coast, but not so much in the basin. That's not to say it may not be mm -hmm. in the near future. Um, so they're, they're the, the main things that are, that are occurring at the moment. Thank you. Right. Okay. I can see on the chat box, there's a question on groundwater. It did, it did briefly touch on that, uh, John. So uh, ground, because groundwater basin, the, uh, does it fall neatly within the uh, uh, hydrological boundary, the Murad Darling Basin, or is there, is there any other instrument to address groundwater, John? Yeah, so ground, groundwater is treated as the part of, part of the total water cycle and is part of the basin plan itself. So groundwater mm -hmm. is, is very much part of that. And as part of the water resource sharing plans that the states develop, they must take into consideration groundwater and the allocation of groundwater uh, systems uh, with the concept that of connected groundwater and surface water systems that they've, they're actually the, the principles of management are applied as a whole of a uh, resource system rather than individual systems. Thank you. So that there'll be a, a, a in, within the 2008 agreement under the basin agreement, right? For, yeah, yeah. The, under the Muda, Muda Darling Basin Agreement, uh, just a bit that, right? Okay, thank you. Right, right. Uh, any other live questions? Yes. There's some noises. Uh, is there any live questions? I got one. I've got one question. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, there's one more land clearing. Yes. Right. Oh, yes. Um, it's, I mean, yes. I've heard a lot and I've read a lot about this water trading in, in Australia. In, in the uh, MD, yes, MDBA, the, um, in the MD, M, M, MDBA area. Now, um, who issues the license right. uh, and and the payments are made or trading is made with the basin states or is it with um, MDBA or water trading? Uh, in terms of in terms of water trading, that, that falls within the state jurisdictions. So uh, licenses were initially uh, uh, issued by um, uh, the state governments. So licenses allow um, uh, individual property owners to have an entitlement for water and have it, and, and that's based on a allocation within a particular year based on what the prevailing uh, water and climate conditions are. So that license allows them an entitlement. And if they get, if it's a normal year, they've got 100% of their entitlement to the property. They, they then can trade that water downstream, not upstream, they can trade that water downstream um, to other license holders. And that market is done through a stock exchange type system and is not done through government departments. Um, the government department runs the stock exchange, but the transaction and the money transaction is between the two entities, the private entities. So that's how that works. It becomes a bit more complicated between states, between Victoria and New South Wales, and there are more complicated measures there. But effectively, the trade is between a willing buyer and a willing seller through a, a stock exchange type system. Right, okay. I, I see a hand from Mr. Moza. Moza Dan yeah, you may ask a question now. Yes, I have Mr. a question. Mr. Mozu. Yes, right, uh, right, thank okay, you, Mr. Please. John. Uh, thank you, Mr. John. That is a wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is uh, with regards to groundwater abstraction. Is there any law governing uh, drilling of boreholes, maybe for irrigation purpose or for domestic use? And uh, is there any charge for that? And how do you go about 
the 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 is there any policy concerning uh, drilling of boreholes within domestic areas, industries, and uh, for agricultural purposes? Thank you. Okay. Um. Uh, so, in terms of groundwater, again, that's the jurisdiction jurisdiction of the states, and I'll I'll go very quickly through what the Victorian situation is, which is similarly reflected in the other states. So, uh, if if the groundwater system is not identified as a stressed system and a groundwater management plan enacted. Um, if, if it is a stress system and declared a, an area, then there's no groundwater licences issued, uh, additional licences issued at all. If it's not declared a stress system, then uh, a, a person may apply for a licence for a stock and domestic use, and that's a free of charge. But they also have to apply for a licence for the construction of the bore and they, that there is a small charge associated with that. So for stock and domestic use in, in, an, uh, uh, um, in an area that's not uh, predetermined to be stressed, then uh, that, that they're able to get a licence of free of charge. But if it's for industrial use or for uh, irrigation use, they, they do need to pay a licence fee uh, and also a, a fee for the volume of water for the entitlement, as well as a fee for the construction licence. Thanks. I'm a, a mirror. Yeah, that's so uh, oh, okay. Uh, I saw a hand from uh, Dr. Azari. Dr. Azari. Sorry, Dato, your line is still breaking up. We can't actually hear you. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Okay, my question is actually pertaining to land clearing activities. I think there are still land clearing activities happening in the basin. So how, how do you regulate this or control this? What level of control do you have over the states in terms of the federal uh, like on the regulation on this sort of activities? Uh, the, the federal government has little control over land clearing in the states. As I mentioned before, uh, in Victoria, the land clearing is, is prohibited. Uh, in New South Wales, there's what's called offset uh, requirements for land clearing and Queensland to a smaller degree. Yeah. Having said that, the federal government has legislation called the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Legislation. And if there is a, a species, whether that be a plant or an animal, that's uh, critically endangered and is threatened by land clearing, then that EPBC Act can be applied and that can actually stop land clearing of vegetation if there is an, what's called a determined species by the EPBC Act. Thank you. Um, Amira, also, um, I did make a commitment that I would be happy to participate in this until 5.30 my time. It's now five, nearly 5.40. So I'm just wondering if there's um uh, oh, oh my, all right. two more questions. Yeah. Yeah, we can close the floor for the questions. Right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. I pass Perhaps, to can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> right, can you hear me now? I hope I hope my line will stay on table. <laughs> this one is gonna show more one. Uh, I think certainly I think the ladies and Gentlemen, I think uh, certainly uh, many of you probably have some more questions to ask from um, John. And uh, I think the kind of frame that we have, uh, we probably have to close the session now. First thing first, I think I must uh, apologize on my part. Uh, uh, times of need, uh, the system feels me in terms of the internet and uh, so the stability. Uh, for that, uh, nevertheless, I think John has come to the quick and chat box. Thank you very much, John, for the letting us and telling us all the challenges. In first, taking us through the reforms uh, actually is taking place in the Mura Darling Basin and uh, highlighting to us the various plans uh, from the instrument. And more so, I think, despite some of all these, uh, we have to learn from you the challenges ahead and for which I think many of you 
can be easily overcome, uh, perhaps through the proper, the so-called uh, uh, roles of all the participants, uh, this challenge to skill can, at least can be overcome in future. And uh, with all the uh, interesting uh, presentation from you, certainly I'm sure that we are looking for all sharing of your experiences, both, I think, especially from the more recent uh, darling, uh, probably the answer, there will be one or two in the chat box, we probably probably refer to you later, and then maybe we can get back to you, and you can give us a written answer. I'd like to thank all the participants for interesting interactions, and uh, for all the questions that you have raised, in, in, in terms of uh, perhaps uh, how we can even apply it in the Malaysian context. All right, with that, uh, I'd like to pass it back to uh, Amira. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dato. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank session to uh, organizer Amira. All right, okay, all right. Um, before we end, um, can I pass to the, um, Dr. Tuan Jasari, just if you have anything to say before we say goodbye? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, of course, uh, I really enjoyed the discussion, and I think everyone is appreciates uh, the uh, subject very much. And I think, uh, yeah, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, our speaker, Mr. John, and also Dato, the moderator, for I think conducting this uh, webinar in a very uh, interesting and manner, interactive manner. So of course, I think uh, there are a lot more questions and also things that we wanted to know. I think probably there should be some I call it uh, some form of uh, possible collaboration or uh, we connection that we can help uh, participants to get to John Redford in one way or another. So I think that is uh, something that we should follow from here so that uh, what we learn from here, we can actually improve our knowledge and also, of course, uh, do a, a, what I call that, uh, uh, undertake a better uh, code of practice or best practices that is actually practiced in other countries in the world. So with that, I would like to conclude that uh, we really appreciate um, everyone and uh, it's uh, a webinar. I think we have about nearly 70 of them from based on what I've saw in my uh, screen. So I think uh, we really appreciate that uh, this has been a very useful discussion and I think we hope to see all of you again in our future programs and event. Thank you very much. Thank you. We apologize. <laughs> Over right. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Apology for the interruption. <laughs> um, can we have all cameras on so we can take photos? And I'm, Mr. Mr. Reed for the leaf. <laughs> Unfortunately, the speaker already checked out. <laughs> yeah, he left. <laughs> okay, but it's okay. Maybe we can just take a group photo first. Yeah, as long as Mr. Kali is around, it's all right. Kali, jangan lari. One, two, three. Okay, again. One, two, three. Yeah. Sari Sungai Apa di belakang tu? Ha, ada Sungai mana tu? Dengan selaru lah. Sungai Buddha, Sungai Buddha, Sungai Buddha. Oh, Sungai Buddha. You always go for the nice one. My, my, my thousand apology. Uh, uh, when when the session was closed, then the, the line turned stable. Say. I don't know what happened to my <laughs> connection. <laughs> okay, thank you right. very much. Uh, anyway, thank you very much thank for you. your participation. You right. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Thank right. you, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice day. Right. Bye, okay. bye. Right. Bye. Advance Hari Raya. Raya. Hari Raya too. Uh, uh, Hari Raya. 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 Hari <laughs> All right, okay, bye. Don't see. <laughs> Bye.
Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Nanti kita jumpa lagi. Muzamir. Gambang tak tunjuk. Oh Muzamir you still there? Okey. Raya raya mana je? Ah ya serendah ah. Yeah. Oh, throw us langau. Have to stay in. Iyalah. Eh? Paksa. Ya. Yeah. And dekat Mr. Perak. Dekat Ipoh pun dah. Mr. Fong ada lagi tu. <laughs> dekat Perak pun dah dah kena kepung lah. Ya. Yeah. Ah uh, careful lah. <laughs> oh, the freedom lah. Jadi lots of freedom. David appreciate the freedom. Ha, <laughs> now you know ah. Now you know. No. Why do you buy freedom kan? Now you know the important freedom. Huh? No, everybody, everybody now know everybody freedom. Is, you cannot fly. <laughs> you cannot fly. You cannot stay. Thank you stay. very much, everyone. Thank you. Terima kasih. Kak Ros pada tu. Okay, Jin. Tapi kata tak gambar ni, tak apa, kan tak pasal ni. Okay, okay. thank you, thank you. First oh. time lah. Rio, Rio jadi presiden, jadi chair meeting. <laughs> first time lah. Ah, uh, first. Lah. Yeah, first time lah. My first program lah. First yeah, yeah. Congratulations lah. Yeah. We put okay. some effort. Hope to see you after MCO. Inshallah, you will be okay. meeting again. Hopefully the <laughs> pandemic will be over lah. Yeah, it will yeah. be good for everyone to have to come back to a normal life. They say October, October. October lah. But okay, hopefully. Uh, okay. But no year stated. October aja. <laughs> <laughs> That is difficult lah. <laughs> yeah. It's October. Which October that tau? <laughs> okay, okay. Assalamualaikum. Okay, okay. Thank you. Waalaikumsalam. Okay, I leave lah. Huh? Okay, thank you.